Welcome to Out of the Blank. Welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. Me with Randy. Randy, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Can you please introduce yourself to everyone out there listening? Oh, it's great to be here. Thanks so much. Um, my name is Randy Benson. I am uh, d- the director of The Searchers, uh, a film, a documentary portrait of the research community that I started. I shot the first frame in Washington, D.C. on June 10th, 2002 with John Judge and Bill Kelly and uh, worked on the film and finally got it done in 2014. And the box set and the screenings and the director's cuts and the producer's cuts um, over the next three years. So it, you know, the film, what I thought it was gonna be to what it ended up being um, was vastly different. And I did not expect a project like that to take me, you know, 12, 14, 15 years to make. Um, But like so many researchers have experienced, um, no, I don't think anyone thought that their initial research in the case would become a lifelong pursuit. Um, so that's kind of my story. I'm a, I teach film at uh, Duke University, and I've just accepted a new position at Davidson College. So I'll be, uh, it's really exciting to be teaching film and building a whole new program at a new, new college. When you talked about when you originally started the film compared to where it ended, um, the kind of shift that happened, it's probably much like my, you know, endeavor or really anybody's dive into the JFK assassination topic. It seems like, you know, I came in on it like, oh, I'm going to figure this out and a short amount of time since everyone else has already compiled all their information but then you realize there's so much more there and you realize why it's taken this long as well too as much as people can say like oh we have an answer already or people can say um you know it's taken this long because there is so much information like i just did it's just a lot of stuff where you start going and it's not even just the amount of information that's in there too. It's the amount of like you interviewing experts for the searchers, for instance. I mean, you start to realize how everyone's kind of like, they'll agree on some things and then there'll be disagreements on certain like little detail spots and those detailed spots, they might seem as something like, Oh, we can get past this, but you really can't overlook a lot of that stuff as well too. I'm talking to so many experts on the show. They agree with some of each other and then some of them don't agree on certain things. And that's where you would say it gets a little bit controversial where I just start wondering what did you learn through doing the searchers like what was the initial did you think you're going to be done in a year did you think you're going to be done two years yeah I thought it would be a a well-researched um complete documentary that would probably take me two to three years um but I quickly learned that to make a film about the research community, I had to become a researcher myself. So that meant um, filing freedom of information requests, seeing what that process was like. That meant spending time in the National Archives in College Park, Maryland, and filing requests for documents and pouring over thousands of pages of documents. Um, and you quickly realize in, in my film, Andy Winarchik mentioned that there are 3000 plus books on the assassination. And that makes total sense because for, for years, what, for 30 plus years, every single piece of information about the assassination was a freedom of information request 
a FOIA request that the government fought at every juncture. So a lot of those requests, just to get one piece of paper, was a FOIA request, then a lawsuit, then another lawsuit, and another lawsuit, and multiple requests. And then a researcher would finally get one page. And that would inform a little bit of a slice of the case. And then they would write a book about the process and about the information that was found in this one document. So it makes total sense that there were so many, that there's so many books and it took us such a long time to get a little bit of information uh, rel relative to what has been released since the Assassination Records Review Board. Um, now, that's another story that involved a massive dump of, of documents that researchers have had to pour through. A lot of the, uh, um, we're talking 13 million pages of documents have been released since the early 90s when the Assassination Records Review Board was convened. Um, and we're still waiting on documents to be released. So what would become, what most researchers thought would be a two to three year endeavor, simply because the government has withheld so much information for so long, the case isn't over. And researchers are still in the case, some of them for the last 50 years plus. When you filed your FOIA requests and when you were looking in the archives, what specifically were you targeting? It seemed like everybody who was an expert in the JFK assassination has different angles of what they, I guess, really what point they really dived into, which, what, what was your particular focus? Well, um, researcher Penn Jones um, said he gave great advice to, you know, the premier researchers in the field, and that was to find one particular piece of the case and research the hell out of it. Um, and most of the amazing research out there has been done that way. And so I took that, I took that to heart. Um, and I started researching um, a little story of my own. Um, my father was, uh, fighter pilot in the Air Force, and during the Kennedy years and during the assassination and years after, he was assigned to the east-west German border as a fighter interceptor. And so what, what they would do would be to fly up and down the east-west German border, shadowed by a Soviet MiG on the east German border, Pete guys like my father on the West German border. And that was the front line of the Cold War. They would fly up and down the East West German border, peel off the next fighter interceptors would do this dance. And this lasted for the entire entirety of the Cold War. My, my dad would say that if a Russian passed gas, he would be scrambled in, in, in the air. That's how volatile and um, on edge, the Cold War was during that, during the height of the Cold War, during the Kennedy years. But when Kennedy was assassinated, my father and his team and his squadron, they were not scrambled. He found out that Kennedy was killed when someone ran into the officers club while he and my mom were having dinner and shouted, did you hear what just happened? So that, when protocol at that level breaks down, my dad knew something was up. He knew something wasn't right. And he always felt that because protocol broke down at that level, that, that, that the government had either foreknowledge or they were involved in the assassination of the um, 
chief executive and the commander in chief of of the air force so so when the jets weren't scrambled that means that was a sign that the government even knew it wasn't russia correct and they didn't want anything to go wrong they didn't want an errant strike to inflame tensions with the soviet union so that's what i started to research and file FOIA requests and try and find information to see if there had been a stand down order. Um, and other researchers, John Judge and Bill Kelly, have done amazing work in the Air Force stand down orders. Um, and, you know, John Judge talked to long range bomb bombers, um, bomber pilots, and and co-pilots and the uh, the code books had been removed on November 22nd, 63. They'd been there on the 21st and they were back on the 23rd. But the day the president was assassinated, the long range code books were removed from our long range bombers. See, people always bring up the point, it's mostly lone nutters that believe that like they wouldn't have been able to um, strategically place all this or have this all planned out because they didn't know that Kennedy was going there until the 18th. And I've heard that they knew way before that, that Kennedy was going to be in Texas at that time. Um, so when you say that they remove they removed the code books, that really kind of shows that the government knew that in advance that when this happens, that means the first thoughts are going to be towards Russia or it's going to be towards Cuba. So the best thing to do would be to remove these code books so no one can go and, you know, immediately start flying out without permission. Or maybe someone gave a, a, a an order without the inner workings or whatever you want to say, um, ca calling the shots. Yeah, exactly. The What they didn't want to happen was an errant strike. Um, they wanted to make sure that that there would be no um, skirmish, no strike, and certainly no um, dropping of a nuclear weapon, a tactical nuke, um, when the story got out that, you know, the, the story that uh, um, a Russian defector, a former Russian defector, assassinated the president so when that story got out that is they did not want to strike and and the protection against that strike is a great indication that protocol wasn't followed and the next assumption that one must make is that there were orders to remove those protocols because that's the only the only reason my my father um thought that he wasn't scrambled on november 22nd 63 was order an order from somewhere so because that's when it, when it comes to your foia request though what exactly like, did you get more benefit from the foia request or did you get benefit from going through the archives and looking at this like what exactly did you pull out or did you get back from the foia request did you get debriefs or anything from any generals that were questioning why there wasn't any codes that were there they were there the day before but then they weren't there on the 22nd yeah i i wasn't able to find any documents about any stand down orders um having to do with with forward tactical strikes or, or um, fighter interceptors from forward positions like the East-West German border, I wasn't able to find anything. And, uh, and so that also made me very suspicious because I believe what my dad had to say, he had no reason to blow smoke up my ass. And, um, and what he had to say verified or strengthened what you know other researchers had found out um and you know john judge didn't find any documents um pertaining to a stand down order um from the uh or removal of code books he had to speak to 
actual pilots, actual co-pilots, actual navigators who were on long range bombers at the time. And, you know, none of them would sign an affidavit, but they all confirmed to him um, that there had indeed been a stand down, stand down order. But you got to remember too that this is this is a topic that people in the military didn't want to touch. You know, guys like my dad, who were just good soldiers, good, you know, they believed in the system. They believed in the military. They believed that they were forces for good. And my dad, you know, in 1963, he believed he was fighting for peace. But after 63, that's when he just began to not have quite as deep belief in the system that he had dedicated his life to. So, Well, it's the example I use when I bring up the Castro assassination attempts. There was like 693 assassination attempts, and each one's crazier than the last. And you start going the way that the public viewed Castro at that point with the way the media was projecting him and the way the military kind of wanted it to go was that he was this ruthless dictator that was terrorizing his people. And no matter how much of it is true, the way that we looked at it, it goes, someone needs to take that guy out. And then imagine if they just switched that over to your president. And now your president is this type of thing. Maybe you don't have to incentivize the people to believe this way, but if you start getting to a point where they just label the president as a threat and it's your government doing all the work, see the general public, even back then, had faith in whatever their government did. That doesn't mean if their government said, hey, we killed our president or whatever, people would agree with that. It doesn't mean that at all. But it just lets you know that when it comes to oppositions that are overseas or something like that, the general public was more out of the loop. They just saw like, we're at war and it's the commies or it's this or it's that. And it was easier to stand from that point of kind of like, I wouldn't say not knowing much, but I would also say kind of not knowing the deep kind of routes that go into um, the whole Castro and Cuba situation. It was more like we're at war. Um, I love where I live. I'm a patriot. And let's make sure we handle those enemies across seas. But then if they take that same power that they're projecting against Castro, maybe not publicize it to JFK. I mean, that would be basically today would be a character assassination. If you see a president or whoever, you know, they don't need to assassinate the person. They can just slander them on media and have the whole public hate them until everyone wants them out of office. But this is that they might've used their military strategies against the president of the United States at this time. Yeah, that's a, that's a distinct possibility that we, we had assassination programs, like you mentioned, um, in place using elements of every institute, virtually every institution within the United States. Um, organized crime, the FBI, the CIA, the DIA. And it's, you know, this, the community is still searching for the mechanics of how, of how it happened, but it's not a far stretch to think that an assassination program that was as complicated as what we already had in place couldn't have just been turned inward. You know, that makes, that's not a far stretch to come up with that conclusion. I do have to raise a question when it comes to the way that you thought about it, which was the way that, oh, if they took the code books out, then it, it has to be someone in, on our inside. Why wouldn't you just think about like if uh, maybe with all the information you had received before that, it probably curved your mind that way. But instead of just thinking, oh, well, if they took the code books out, then it must have been a lone nut. They didn't want us to act out against Russia. Instead, you kind of thought of it the way I think of it, which is like it was the government that really did it. And I, I, I only know that because the information we have now about Oswald. So did you come across anything was when you were when you were getting these requests and you were diving down this? I know you said you were doing it with the documentary, but did you already receive a couple of interviews that kind of had your mind headed in a certain direction? Well, interviews with with um, John Judge, you know, he was the central character in my film. And so. He was the, he was my barometer of, uh, of information, of the quality of information, and not just of specific pieces of information, but to how to, how to think about information that I was getting, how to question it, um, verification, 
so what was what was really interesting is uh is that after speaking with so many researchers um you know documents can be complicated and and the information can be so recalcitrant that you have to be able to verify the veracity of even just a, a single piece of paper and um one of the ways that researchers do that is by finding the surrounding documents. So most documents would, would say, um, in response to your query of, of December 22nd, 1965, here are the findings. And so you can go back and find that previous document of December 25th, um, 22nd, 55 for instance, right? Um, but there's some documents that are very controversial within the, within the um, research community that the surrounding documents haven't been found. And, and so that's an example of, of taking many documents with a grain of salt that if the if they can't be if their veracity can't be proven then they need to be taken with a grain of salt um and one of those documents is the mccone rowley document um you know that's very i'm sure you know about it. it's very controversial in the research community could you explain a little bit of it i don't think i've heard of it sure um john mccone was the uh um director of the, of the CIA and Rowley, James Rowley was the director of the Secret Service at the time of the assassination. And there's a, there's a document um, that I'm gonna get this wrong, but I think it was from um, Rowley Secret Service to McCone asking or stating that based on your inquiry into what we knew about Oswald, that he worked for the FBI and the CIA, that he worked for the government. And so that's what this document states. And um, many, many very respected researchers call this the smoking gun document. Um, and you can look it up on, McCone Rowley, I think there's even a blog of just about that docu document. Is it is it is it a smoking gun because a lot of people don't agree that Oswald was some type of intelligence agent? Which I mean, I've heard both. Correct. I've I've heard very I've heard both sides of that. Um, mostly, I know that there's quotes of saying that his profile fit the description of someone with a fingerprint of intelligence. And I didn't really start thinking Oswald was a double agent until I saw uh, the new documentary, Max Good's documentary, um, The Assassination of Miss Payne. Now, I don't think that I think the pains might be involved. But I think they're unwillingly involved or unknowingly involved, I would say, um, in a lot of aspects, because, I mean, the less you know, the better, in a sense. And that comes from a secret spy standpoint. The government can just set stuff up and you don't even know. Like if I always use this example, if Oswald was the lone gunman, you would if that was your plan A to have one person go crazy and or plan to shoot the president, you wouldn't just have one plan to kill the president. You'd have multiple. So then you would have multiple shooters. But there are a bunch of people that weren't coordinating together. They just didn't know that there was other people doing the same exact thing doing the same mission. I mean, that's the smartest military tactic. And when Miss Payne started talking about um, Oswald had multiple phone calls out of jail, I go, that is completely, if it's a lone nut, doesn't matter whoever it is. If you're a criminal and you just broke a law, you get one phone call. You don't get multiple phone calls different days to, or in, in that 48 hour time period, he had two phone calls to the Payne's house. And it was just like, what the first phone call was about some type of uh paper or some type of thing and then the second phone call was to talk to marina oswald and it's just, i mean yeah yeah so you just get to this point of like 
that doesn't make sense where you start going, if you're secret intelligence, you start going, Hey, maybe they gave him a couple phone calls because he was already tied in with the government. And obviously that's speculation, but I mean, it's not bad speculation. Yeah. Well, you know, um, I'm kind of a document nerd, um, in, in terms of the, the case, I think that's our best path to, revealing the truth um, behind the assassination and most importantly why he was assassinated but the phone calls are really interesting because like you said the two calls to the pains he made another call to the aclu in new york city to um, get in touch with with a uh, a civil liberties lawyer and then he made another call and that was to Raleigh, North Carolina, that researcher Grover Proctor has done amazing work into this, into this call. Um, Grover Proctor is right here in North Carolina. He's just a couple towns away from me. Are you still alive? Oh, yeah. Okay. I interviewed him a couple of weeks ago. I got to get him on the show then. Yeah, I will give you his info and he would love to... Um, talk with you when did your documents transfer over from looking at the military like it seems like you investigated a little bit of oswald as well too well i invest <clears throat> excuse me i i investigated um the work that other researchers researchers had already done so i looked i looked deep into the raleigh call which is fascinating um you got to walk me through it. All right. I got to know. Yeah. Now. I'm curious. Yeah. In, in short, the, the Cliff Notes version is that uh, Oswald um, made a call on at a quarter, of, I think a quarter of 11 local time, Dallas time from the, from the jail to um, he called the switchboard. And the switchboard in the Dallas County Jail said they made notes saying that he wanted to get in touch with a John Hurt in Raleigh, North Carolina. Now, there were two John Hurts in Raleigh. One was a carpet salesman um, who had no interest and Oswald would never have known. But the other John Hurt was a former U.S. military intelligence officer from World War II. And so one of the you know, researchers had found that there was no record in, in any of Oswald's personal belongings. There was no reference to a John Hurt in any of his papers. But Oswald knew the phone number and knew that he wanted to get in touch with John Hurt in Raleigh, North Carolina. Now, the Swikert Committee and the Church Committee and the House Select Committee, um, and all these, all of the committees that looked into the assassination in the 70s, uh, they all agreed that Oswald made that call, that it was an outgoing call and that it was to a John Hurt, a former US military intelligence officer, but none of them um, decided to make a case of it. And Robert Blakey, the chief counsel, the, the chief counsel for the House Select Committee on Assassinations, even said that the call was made and and that they couldn't um, verify what it meant. So they did not include it in the final report of the HSCA. But when Grover Proctor spoke to Blakey, Blakey said that it did happen. It was an outgoing call. Oswald did try to contact a former me member of the military intelligence. Did anybody check that guy's background to see what he did with the intelligence community? Did, did he have like some type of cleaner background or something? Cause my first speculation would be an aspect. If you tackle from the Oswald Patsy angle, um, which is what I think 
um, then you look at the fact of he's calling someone to either get information on why he was set up or to try and find a way to help get him out of that situation, um, which you would have like a cleaner, not necessarily someone that cleans up after the events with like bodies and stuff like that, but more like being able to clean up a situation when it comes to you're in jail, I need to get out. Yeah, well, you know, Grover concluded that um, he was calling a cutout, a military cutout. And it's not that that necessarily John Hurt would have the means to get Oswald out of anything. But, you know, cutouts, when someone contacts a cutout, it just means that I'm in this place, I need help. And he was trying to alert that he needed out, that he needed help from the intelligence committee community. And so that's what a, a cutout is. And like you said, a, a cleaner, you know, a cleaner or a cutout, it's not necessarily about that person, but it's about the organization. So the interesting thing about about the uh, Raleigh call is that it never went through. There were two figures, um, black suits, the, uh, the uh, call takers in the, in, the, um, in the switchboard office said that two figures, possibly from, they didn't know if they were from the FBI or the CIA, but they told the switchboard not to put the call through. So they lied to Oswald and said that they were unable to, to uh, make a connection on the Raleigh end. And so, um, but there were authorities in the switchboard office that knew that he tried to contact, contact John Hurt, former military intelligence officer in Raleigh, North Carolina. And it's just a, one of the weird facts of the case that he had no reason to contact anyone in North Carolina. There's no record of him having any friends or, or, uh, or family or any contacts in North Carolina at, at all. Yet that call was made. And so that's one of the many mysteries of the case. And um, I highly recommend having Grover on because um, the case, the Raleigh call just gets more complicated and more interesting um, the deeper, deeper you dig. When it comes to the two men in suits, did anybody speculate if that was like secret service members that were there? I would think they would be monitoring somebody that just killed the president. So, I mean, it would make sense, but also it also – it brings in the aspect of Jack Ruby as well, too. It will make more sense if you have this person, you know, that just killed the president, allegedly killed the president. And 48 hours later, he gets shot by a strip club owner. Um, the CIA and the mafia were heavily tied together, we found out later. But you look at an aspect of those two men in suits, CIA, FBI, Secret Service. Did you look deeper into that? Um, well, Grover couldn't find out where they were from. There was no record of, of what agency they were with. However, they did not stop the call to the ACLU lawyer. They didn't stop the call to um, the Payne's resident, trying, Payne's residents trying to get in touch with Marina. But they did stop the call going to Raleigh, North Carolina. So. That's so weird. It is weird. It is weird. Did they did they know who he was probably contacting? Like, I mean, you have to think he probably makes some friends in the intelligence community. Yes, certainly not even maybe friends, but maybe someone that might owe you a favor. I mean, that's the weirdest thing about Oswald's profile is the same day Oswald flew back from Russia, there was another agent that also came back, which is all the all the reporters hopped on. They were the ones that were investigating him. Oswald flew right under the radar. Nobody even stopped him, didn't do anything. It was like, it was like, a, this, yeah, but either, yeah, it was the same day, I think. Um, they both, it was two agents that came back. Everyone tackled onto one, interviewing him. And I got this from Gary Hill. And also, I think Larry Hancock mentioned it as well, too. And it just makes it, really 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 suspicious because 
I mean, if we go from the angle of like, I always tackle like Oswald was 24 years old and somehow he managed to baffle a Warren commission. He managed to assassinate the president, all these types of things that they're incriminating him on. And I start going, what's the separation from like, I'm 24. I mean, it, you got to think everyone at this age, 16, 17 years old, you're going right into the military. Uh, you're probably at this time, you're going to go in the military a couple of years, depending on how long you serve for. And then you get out and the next, thing you know what, I'm 24 years old and I'm sitting on a street corner. Um, some limo comes up to me and goes, Hey kid, you want a job? And I'm like, sure, mister. And then next thing I know, I'm a CEO of a business. And then one day I hear a knock on my door and it's a bunch of cops there telling me that I just, I'm being arrested for embezzlement. And it's like, what? No, I just got set up. I was wondering why all these nice things were going my way. It wasn't a stroke of luck. It wasn't my chance of time. It was they, they were setting me up for something. But then it makes me question, was there any red flags on Oswald? Was there any certain strikes on his profile? Or was he just being set up in the sense of like how Wagyu is, where you breed it to the last minute or you, you feed it all these nice things to the last minute and then kill it? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, and there are researchers that have done um, you know, as you know, deep, deep work into who Oswald was um, and, and uh, how he was found himself in that position at all. Um, you mentioned something earlier about um, multiple plots. And, you know, there, there was the Chicago plot and the Miami plot. And it seems as if there were Oswald figures, type figures in Chicago. Um, and that plot was thwarted in part by Abraham Bolden. Um, there was the Miami plot that, uh, um, that was stopped and Kennedy never went to Miami and he never went to Tampa. But he went to, he was allowed Despite those threats, Kennedy was allowed to go to Dallas. And so I think that's very interesting. Another interesting thing about, about Oswald and, and others is the false defector program right here in Nagshead, North Carolina, on the coast, that, um, that existed, that it's, it's uh, assume that Oswald, or it's been been proven to the extent that it can be proven that Oswald attended the false defector program. And when he went to um, the Soviet Union, he was in fact working for the United States government as a false defector. And what was the point of the false defector program? Oh, to um gain as much information um from the soviet union as possible so um the false defector program meant that the people were trained individuals were trained to defect to the soviet union to try and be put in places where they could then gain information about the soviet union any information at all, infrastructure of in, in, within industry, or um, possibly if they were put in military installations to gain any information at all. And then they would defect or come back to the United States and report what they had found, or try and report what they had found while they were, in fact, false defectors. And the fact that the defector program existed is is widely accepted. Um, but even though it debunks the fact that Oswald was trying to defect to Russia because um, he was trying to tear up his citizenship, which is usually what I hear from comments, um, usually in the Facebook forum, someone mentions like he was trying to he, he was easily a lone nut. He didn't like our president because he was trying to tear up his U.S. citizenship. And I go, even the Russians said that he spoke very bad Russian. And they talked about the fact that they believed he was a spy from the first spot. And that's what I've heard from like Gary Hill, who, you know, runs the other Oswald. Yeah. And what one of the interesting things and we get getting back to the documents kind of um, 
when Boris Yeltsin was president of, he was the first president after the fall of the wall, um, first president of Russia, he gave President Clinton all the Soviet documents or a trove of documents that the Soviet Union had on the assassination of JFK. And in those documents were, was, were information, was information about um, Lee Harvey Oswald. And what interested researchers about the documents wasn't necessarily about Lee Harvey Oswald, except how high those documents made it. So the documents on Oswald within the Soviet Union made it all the way up to um, Nikita Khrushchev. So the the premier of the Soviet Union had, had reviewed the documents of this so-called low-level nothing person who defected to the Soviet Union. And, and very few documents, he reviewed very few documents having to do with any defectors in the Soviet Union. It wouldn't it wouldn't make it up to the premier of the Soviet Union, yet Oswald's documents did. Um, Rex Bradford is a great expert on the Soviet documents that you might you might want to speak with him. When it comes to the trove of documents that were given on the assassination of JFK, was it just specifically keeping tabs on Oswald or was there other documents as well, too? Because I have to think if you see that the president gets assassinated, if Russia is doing their own investigation or if Russia is doing their own thing, it's probably to have evidence to say that we weren't involved with this. So you can't blame us for this type of situation. And the majority of the Soviet do Soviet documents indicate that they were not involved at all in the assassination of, of the president, that they were as befuddled. And they also um, assumed that this was an inside job by, now this is what the Soviet documents um, um, uh, included, was that they believed that it was hardliners in the US military that killed their own president. Um, and one of the reasons they believe that is because there were hardliners in the Soviet government that wanted to out Khrushchev after he started making, um, joining Kennedy in peace efforts um, near the end of Kennedy's um, presidency in the months leading up to his assassination. Well, there's that interview of Marina Oswald where she talks about like, they're like, why did you suddenly change your story? You seem to have said that, you know, it. I think originally she said, I guess it was Oswald that did it. And then she changed it. And she said, no, it wasn't Oswald. And they're like, why did you suddenly change your opinion or change your uh, choice on if it was Oswald or not? And he goes, she didn't goes, I, I didn't know much about the American government. And it was like, so you're admitting that it's kind of similar to your government. Like it was like a weird kind of like, so you, you're starting, you thought we were different and you realize no, that the government did kill JFK. And it was like that interview. I don't know if it was the af after the Oprah Winfrey interview, but it's in the assassination of Miss Payne. And it, to me, it's like I'm, a lot of stuff's lining up and a lot of details getting added in there too. And much like uh, probably with, you know, your interviews of all these experts and everything, there's different gaps that, are getting filled in as more people are giving you more information about their specific investigations. Um, I just, I, how did you, I mean, I mean, doing the con well, doing the conference and everything. I'm just curious, like when you're finding out all this, I mean, I know the, the searchers is you can get it on YouTube for anybody out there listening. You can watch it on YouTube. Um, but, were, were you shocked or were you surprised and don't take this as an insult that it wasn't picked up by national television because what I started noticing about like the ones that get like Yemis and Grammys they're all stuff that agrees with the official narrative it's like 
Oliver Stone had to get funding from the UK and then it finally got picked up by, I think it was uh stars or something like that. And you're, you're starting to, Oh, showtime. And you, you really start noticing. It's like none of these, and they're great films. Yours is a great film. Oliver's is a great film. They're very, very good. And they're very, very supported by a lot of evidence. And there's a lot of very credible people that are speaking about this situation too. And what I learned from the searchers and every expert that was shown on there, it necessarily wasn't about, you know, we're going to get the Republicans for this. No, it was about, we need to clear the historical record. And speaking with David Denton, that was the same kind of take he had, which is like, it doesn't matter what happened then. It matters that we get the factual stuff now. So we don't, because it's part of our history, whether you want to b- believe it to be true or not, the record is not set as much as people can say the record is set. No, because this is one of the giant, most controversial topics that have lasted almost 60 years now. And that's not a record that's set. That's not an agreement of a narrative. That is not. There's a lot of people that believe that there was conspiracy involved in there. And when you're keeping documents still from the public, that does not solidify faith in what you say is true. No, you're right. And uh, you asked me about the, uh, did I receive any pushback or why would my film not not receive traction at a at a national level um or a broadcast level i swear to god i wasn't insulting you no 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 please it's it's interesting because uh um you know i have an interesting story about this that my i made a short film called man and dog it was my student film and it won the student academy award and um that's a huge award and it and the film got traction. It was a portrait of an animal control officer from a small North Carolina county. But it went to Cannes Film Festival, went to the International Documentary Film Festival in Amsterdam. It won awards all over the place. And the only reason I'm saying that, saying this, is that it got picked up by the Independent Film Channel and got, lo- got domestic distribution um throughout north america and this was a short documentary that i made and afterwards the next question from distributors who have already purchased work that i've made is what do you have next and um when i told people well i'm i'm making this film about researchers of the of the jfk assassination um and, and when people would then say that their next question would be, well, what do you think happened? And I say, well, these are researchers who ha- are investigating that the official story was wrong and that Oswald had nothing to do with the assassination and that they're critics of the Warren report. It's as if crickets were were in the room and distributors wouldn't wouldn't even talk about the film if it questioned the official version i didn't get any traction at all i would be asked is does this support the in your ultimate findings does it support the warren report and when i'd say no it does not you know they would say we're not interested and so controversy sells to a certain point. I'll tell you that much. You would think that the media would be all over this, like a, like a baby on a teat or something like that. But it, you're exactly what you're explaining is the same thing. It's still happening today. There was the guy that made the film about the Russian doping scandal about how Russia was doping there. And he did interviews with the people that were giving the Russian Olympians drugs and everything to fake the Olympics or, you know, to get first in the Olympics They got picked up by Netflix. That guy got picked up by a bunch of things. And then he made, uh, tried to make another one about Saudi Arabia and their ties with all their like Pegasus servers and Washington Post and like all these crazy connections with like Bezos and all this. Nothing, not a single damn thing. And you start going like, 
people can say like, oh, that was back then the Kennedy assassination that could, you know, it's impossible. I'm like, no, the methods have gotten a hell of a lot better. And this is what's one of the most important factors about clearing the record. It's not about tearing down your government. It's about making sure that we're not going down this dark path. And now we're not going to be able to find traces of that. It's like watching a bobber in the water and immediately you get that line and you start reeling it in and then it goes away and you go, I'm going to sit for a minute. You don't necessarily see the same same bobber going up and down. You necessarily don't see the fish bite at all. Maybe the fish went off somewhere else, and then it's harder to find. Yeah, that's a great analogy. And and the the past is prologue. Um, the reason we study the JFK assassination is to inform our present situation. So um, the example the example of uh, I, I can't remember the director's name of the of the Russian scandal movie and the Saudi Arabia movie, but that's a great example of forces, current forces keeping information that the American public in the world should know about. Um, the forces keeping this information from from the people. That's a perfect example that the past is prologue and that's why we investigate the assassination of president kennedy do you think that it was a good thing that it didn't get picked up by national television do you think that it would actually like probably get messed with in a sense like if that got picked up on national television do you think they wouldn't just suggest something like would you you know if you offered it up being like if someone tossed out an offer to you and they go we like your film we'll take it but we just add could you maybe put this in there like conspiracy on the label or put something like that even though conspiracy is real legal language the way the public is still receiving it is as that this doesn't exist or this is like fantasy style things which it's good to have that separation rich told me about but do you think that if they added that label onto the film would you would you accept it then i feel like i wouldn't take it i feel like having it on youtube um just getting it more traction through the eyes of the public can come across it and see the whole thing and really appreciate all the work you put into it and all the interviews that you did to it i just don't see that on like a, a network having that done in such a sense i mean that's why maybe we have some streaming services that would do such things but you know if you're going to put it on national television, their whole thing will be like, put a giant label in front of it that says, you know, we're going to show you the conspiracy and show why it's not. And then they play the film. And then afterwards, they usually commentate afterwards and it completely just destroys all the work you put into it. I think had my ultimate conclusion been that, that there may have been a conspiracy, but that the Warren Commission report was most likely accurate i think the film would have gotten picked up um, i truly do but the fact that my conclusion from speaking to so many researchers um it's you know my conclusion is that i agree with with their work i agree with their methods and so that's why I concluded that the official version was was um, bullshit, and that excuse me, I hope we can say that on on the podcast. Curse before I did. I'm I, I'm glad you did. Thanks. Okay, good. Um, yeah. So that's why, um, you know, I my goal was to make a film about the researchers and what they have found and the best researchers and the forces that they faced and are still facing um, to do their work. And that's why I included that whole section on the counter critics. Um, you know, Dale Murphy's in there and you know, Max Holland and um, Vince Bugliosi, because I made the film right after he had or I was still working on the film after he had released his, what, 1800 page support of the Warren report. Um, did, so you did all these at the conference, right? The, the conference in Dallas, you were interviewing all these people that were just, they were there. So you might as well pull out the camera and be able to ask them questions. Or did you go to their houses and things? 
I went to their homes. Did you reach um, out to Max Holland or did you reach out to Gerald Posner? No. And the reason I didn't is that I was making, I was making the film of two reasons. I was making a film about the researchers of the JFK assassination and none of them had done in my, um, to my mind, really good, honest research. Plus, and more importantly, I felt that they had gotten all the time and I had two hours and I included 13 researchers in, in my film, which is really too many people um, in, a two, in a 90 minute documentary. I just didn't have the time to include the Warren report all over again. And that's what Gerald Posner would have given me. And that's what um, Dale Murphy would have given me. Plus what I did include of them in the film, I included research of theirs, but through the eyes of, of critics of the Warren Report, researchers who are critics of the Warren Report, if that makes sense. So basically I just didn't, didn't have time to include the Warren Report all over again. Did you essentially agree with all the experts that you interviewed, at least with on, on, you probably agree with most things, but there's even some things that I can't, like, I know some people believe that the, the Texas oil industry was involved in the assassination of JFK. And I don't, maybe, maybe that was like I was mentioning before, where you had multiple plans going on. Maybe there was the government trying to do what they were trying to do. And then it was an oil company that had like a side thing that we might not have a lot of information on. I have no clue. I just, I, that one to me, I never dived down because that seemed like a very big thing. Um, especially if you're going to go against the government. I mean, if the government agrees of getting rid of the president, but at the same time, that's just like a, any owner of a business, no matter if they're putting restrictions on your thing, unless they're really tied, connected with the government at the time, then I could see that. But that just seems like it's a red flag to me. Yeah, what's what's interesting is that um, a lot of researchers get tied up in um, the shoe size of people in Dealey Plaza. And one of the things that um, that John Judge and said to me, and that's something that Penn Jones said to him, was that the shots weren't fired from Dealey Plaza, they were fired from the Pentagon. Um, and so the first thing you have to do when researching the assassination is to get out of Dealey Plaza and research the why he was killed, who benefited, and who had the power to cover it up? And those are the three questions that Oliver Stone asked in, or you know, the character X played by Donald Sutherland asked in the movie JFK. And I think they're the real questions that we researchers need to continue to ask. And it's interesting also that um, when I first met John Judge, he asked me who I thought killed JFK. And I said, I don't know, but Lee Harvey Oswald didn't. And he said, that's the perfect, perfect answer. That I don't know is a perfectly good response to the question of who killed JFK. Because, and that's a perfect place to start. Um, well, well, that usually when people say like if you say that oswald was a patsy or oswald didn't kill jfk then people go who then and it's like well nobody was looking for an answer there was just the main thing of the warren commission should have been to investigate the death of jfk all angles of it but instead it became this aspect of oswald is going to be the person that's going to pay the crime like they already had a target in their mind which if you're doing an investigative report um, in the death of somebody, you're looking at every single aspect. Let's let's start with our first piece of evidence. But this was an all out attack on making one person fall on the sword of killing the president. And that's just not how uh, the commission should have been set up. No commission should have a goal in mind, but to find out who killed the president, not 
pick somebody and then immediately start attacking the crap out of them, throwing a bunch of evidence that wouldn't last in court. Um, the chain of custody on the bullet doesn't last. Um, there's a lot of aspects of it that really wouldn't last in court. And you start getting into this aspect of when we talk about examining the events around JFK. Now I know about like Bay of Pigs invasion. Do you look at the aspect of what Kennedy was doing in Africa where they made the deal um, when Tom Aboya sent that letter saying that he wanted to, you know, how are we going to build up our country if we don't have anyone here who's educated? Um, and he wanted to send some people to go get college education and come back to their country to you know, start building up Africa because we made a deal with them that in a couple months we would return. And it would be basically the United States was going to own Africa in a sense. We gave them a couple months to get their crap together and you know, build up the best they can. And if they couldn't manage it, we were going to take it over. But then Kennedy funded $100,000 out of his own pocket um, to wrote him a check. And one of those people that was able to be educated in Africa happened to be Barack Obama's father. Um, that's in Oz, uh, that's in uh, Oliver Stone's film um, that was written by Jim DiEugino on uh, JFK Destiny Betrayed, the four hour version. And you go, that's a strike. So, I mean, that's two right there. Maybe the third one would be the Cuban Missile Crisis as well, too. You know, he's banning. Uh, nuclear we uh, nuclear weapons. So you get into this aspect of like everything that we've seen is like, this is a great thing for humanity. It's not just about preservation of America. It's just about preservation of just the world in general. Um, that That's a strike, but you know, to us, it's not a strike to the military. It is. Sure. And, and you're getting into the long list of, of items that um, into the why uh, that Kennedy was assassinated. And you're right, his support of third world democracy and anti-colonialism was very threatening to the powers of the world, the traditional powers of, of Western Europe. Um, um, his refusal to um, invade Cuba during the Bay of Pigs and the Cuban Missile Crisis um, and was, was major, his, uh, sending out of, of, uh, um, the doves of peace to the Soviet Union and his working with Khrushchev on how to build a lasting peace in the world was very threatening. And just the list of things that Kennedy was doing. If you're, in, in terms of documents, if uh, one of the one of the major almost canons of literature that we have from from the assassination is are the letters between Khrushchev and Kennedy during the Cold War. And they're all letters of these two men working for peace. And uh, I think that is that is a very overlooked part of the assassination. That these two men were, at the beginning, they were adversaries, but after the Cuban Missile Crisis, they both stood up to the right, well, the hardliners within their governments who wanted war. They stood up to them and they were working together for peace. And that's another amazing lesson that we can learn for today. That at the height of at the height of tensions, at the brink of the destruction of the world, these two men chose peace. And for that, they one was murdered, and the other was put in thrown in exile for the rest of his life. And uh, that's a just a tremendous lesson for us, for us to remember today. That that's why we do the work. And for me, another lesson that gives me hope. One of the many things that that gives me hope in this case that sh that traditionally shouldn't give anyone hope is that you're here and. I'm here, and thousands of citizen researchers are out there doing the work 
to reveal the truth of why Kennedy was assassinated and who did it and what we can do now to take back our democracy and so that this never happens again. And that gives me hope that that researchers are out there doing the work. I wouldn't call myself a researcher. I'm definitely a curious kid, though. Um, but what, yeah. you're, well, you're 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 giving people um, a voice, and uh, you're you're a curious young man, 24. You're you know a lot more than I. I did when I was 24, buddy. So you're doing a great, great job and a huge service to the community. Did you ever look into all the deaths of the witnesses that happened after um, the assassination of JFK? I didn't, but I, of course, read um, all the Forgive My Griefs um, by Penn Jones. And he's the one who did the the yeoman's work in... Um, into the deaths of the witnesses, especially early on. You know, um, Penn Jones was a uh, was the editor of the Mid- Midlothian Mirror in uh, in Midlothian, Texas, right outside of Dallas, and he would have, <laughs> you know, it was a tiny newspaper in a tiny town, and so he'd have like. On, on tap this week is a pottery convention and Mrs. Jones is having Mrs. Smith over for tea. And these witnesses to the assassination of the President Kennedy happened this week and, and he would have the connection. And it's fascinating reading. You can go back and find old Midlo- Midlothian mirrors, but all of the witness deaths are included in the Forgive My Gr- Grief series by Penn Jones, and they're fascinating. Well, that question leads up into the aspect of MK Ultra, which is, I, I didn't know if you looked into that at all, or if you, because uh, that one's just weird, because I, I, I'm trying to get everyone's kind of take on it, because there was like witnesses that died from cancer, then Jack Ruby before his court case. And I know people bring up the point that Jack Ruby already had cancer, but it's like, yeah, but your symptoms start ramping up pretty freaking fast, you know, um, right before his court appointment, it seemed like it all happened at once. And I guess you can't really predict cancer, it happens at different rates but i talked to a cancer biologist who um studies basically growing cancer and trying to find ways that we can use medications to tear it down and he said even that was suspicious i had to ask the jfk question i had to ask about jack ruby um and i i mean i look i i've studied mk ultra i've studied deep into that and how it ties in with manson but this all this leads up into i know you're on the board of political assassinations right i'm on a cdpr the Center for Deep Deep Political Research. I'm on the board of with Rich Bartholomew, Joe Green, and Jeff Worcester. So do you see the connections? Like have you been able to look and like use your information and your talks with experts from JFK to be able to look and see the direction of things that not necessarily stopped or you know they just evolved. Um, from that day, I always talk about 19, uh, I always talk about uh, that day when Kennedy was killed in 1963 as a turning point in history, as the point of they got away with something. And that's necessarily everything after that Watergate, um, Operation Midnight Climax. I mean, there's so many events that start happening where you start going, this is just a dog that's figured out that it doesn't have to be on the leash anymore. It doesn't have to do anything or fly under the radar. It can do whatever it wants, whenever it wants to do so. And it can get away with it because I think a good statement or good quote to say would be because the public doesn't read. Yeah. And that's, I think you're hitting on a a great point that after the JFK assassination, um, all of these programs became almost mainstream. And that's what was revealed in the church committee hearings in the 70s. And that's those hearings opened up all the different committees and subcommittees and ultimately led to, or partly led to the um, House Select Committee on Assassinations, the House um, research into the 
the JFK assassination. But, you know, after the assassination of Kennedy, programs like MKUltra run by Sidney Gottlieb um, was, you know, these programs um, acted with impunity. They, they were able to do whatever they wanted to do. Um, and, uh, and that's another lesson for us today that until we find out exactly what happened and why it happened, these things will continue to happen. Do you think more people question it though? Like if you ask probably the, a lot of people back then when Kennedy was assassinated, I think a, the majority um, would probably agree that there was conspiracy involved in it. And I think it has more people questioning now about a lot of things that the government does, but also I know a lot of people blame the media for back then saying the media was too scared or the media was cowardly. I don't think so. I think there was a very, very weird relationship that was going on the, on with the media and the government back then. And that was the fact that you were incentivized not to go against the official story. I mean, exclusive interviews. And today we expect that from media to jump, like I said, at your film, jump at something that's controversial, like a meaty steak. And they didn't. And it seems like they have fine lines of what they choose to indulge as conspiracy. And I think JFK, sadly, as much as we want the information out on it, I think it's very, very I think the fact that it's been so long. Um, it's not that it's a dead topic because you'll find a lot of people my age and a lot of people older that are very interested in the assassination of JFK and finding the truth behind it. But also, I don't see the media, you know, doing anything about that. They talked about the release of documents, but where was the coverage on the fact that it was delayed? Where was the questioning on that? You know, that's a that to me, that's just like, why isn't there more than that? I see more about Gabby Petito, a missing influencer for like three months on television who I've never heard of, but apparently she's a big deal. But I, JFK, everyone's heard of and he is a big deal. And still the media didn't question the delayed release of the documents. There was just a couple stories on like Anderson Cooper talked about it for 10 minutes. Yeah, well, you know in regards to the JFK assassination and the media, the role of the media, there's some great work out there. And, um, you know, Joe McBride and Mal Hyman have done amazing work. And there's a, there's other work out there about the role of the media. And I included that, um, a sequence in my film about that. And it wasn't that the media was lazy and it wasn't that they were that, um, they were confused. There was a concerted effort to push the official story and to deny anything that had to do with criticizing the official story. Um, William Paley was, you know, he was the longtime chief, chief executive of CBS News. He was a founder of the Central Intelligence Agency. He was one of the founders. He was one of the first members of the CIA. And so it's not, it's not a too far stretch to, to think that why would he do anything except support the official version when looking at, at the assassination, even tangentially, one of the main suspects is the Central Intelligence Agency. He would never question it. And he gave those orders right down the line to William, to Walter Cronkite and to Dan Rather, who made his career off of supporting the official version of the Warren Report. Yeah, your opening scene in Searchers when you had Walter Cronkite talking um, about the death of JFK. And there was a couple of things that I saw in your film that was also in Destiny portrayed different segments, like full segments. Like you showed the Zapruder um, angle of it. Um, you showed it a couple minutes longer than what was showed in Destiny portrayed, which it gave me more kind of 
information on it because like I said, I, I never saw that live shot. I'm sure I could find it on YouTube somewhere, but it was just interesting to see the kind of full scoop scope of the view. I thought they would just be like, yeah, we'll talk about it in a minute. I figured it was going to be like a couple of seconds where they just talked about like, that was a horrible thing and sorry for showing the audience. But I mean, did they analyze the Zapruder film? Did they look through stuff like that? Did you actually see media actually taking a shot at this or taking a deeper dive into it? Cause Walter Cronkite was just reporting what was there you know like that aspect of things but did any of them go to like exclusive like in depth on the actual assassination like uh showing of the zapruder film for everyone to see well the zapruder film um wasn't showed to the american public until uh, 1975 when robert groden and dick gregory took it on the gerardo rivera show um and uh at the with the threat of time life suing them um Geraldo Rivera really took a chance um showing the film to the United States public and it was after that showing that the, there was a huge uproar from the American public and that's one of the many things that initiated the House Select Committee on Assassinations investigation in the 70s in the late 70s. Um, but there had been dozens before 1975, CBS, NBC, ABC had produced dozens and dozens of quote unquote comprehensive studies of the assassination, but they all, none of them showed the Zapruder film. And all of them concluded that the Warren report was the was correct in the official version. They supported the official version. Um, yet by looking at the Zapruder film, people were able to see that there had been a shot from the front. At least one shot came from the front. And if you have a fourth shot, you have conspiracy in the assassination of JFK. Then you have to start investigating conspiracy and that's what the mainstream media did not want to do. I, I show in my film, um, uh, Dan Rather, describing, describing seeing the Zapruder film um, just the day of the assassination. And he mischaracterizes it that, that Kennedy's head was was pushed violently forward from the shot in the Zapruder film. But by seeing the film, of course, we see that his, the president's head does not go violently forward. It goes violently in reverse. That's what gets me every time is when people say like the Zapruder film was altered. I was like, so it had to be a specific moment in the film that was altered, not the whole film. Right. And, you know, I'm not an expert into whether the film was altered. I'm not an expert into the the photographic or film evidence of the case. But whether the film was altered or not, what we see is the shot coming from the front. It's That's back the most to the important left. thing. Yeah. And back into the left. Yeah. Well, the jet effect doesn't make any really sense and i had gary aguilar on here explain um there's only three types of nerve connections in the brain and none of them would make you do that reaction that they said that that bullet did if it was hit from behind um it's just it's it's like this moment and i'm sure you can tackle it from the center for uh i'm gonna blank on the name i'm sorry i know it's c c d c d p r yeah mm -hmm. um i know you can tackle it from probably the same perspective i'm gonna look at it here which is an aspect of nobody in the general public at this point in time has even today it sounds nuts so when you start saying that the government killed the president no one back then even knew or there was no speculation there was none of that being heard about and then you even say it now people i mean they'll listen to it but they'll call it a conspiracy or they'll call it like that doesn't make any sense or that's fantasy 
But when you start examining, you start kind of talking about everything, you start looking at like, why would, if there was a front shot, what is it possible that if they edited the film and it was the windshield, you see the windshield reflection. That means that something hit that. They didn't just pass over a sunspot. It, it's impossible. There was a giant reflection from the front of the windshield that where David Mantic explained to me, a bullet went through. And I think a lot of it gets really lost in a lot of the details when people start going into this and this and this. It's like, well, now you've lost root of the main question. The main point here is why? Why was he attacked? Why would the government do such a thing? Not how the government did such a thing, why the government did such a thing. And that's the main question you got to kind of root yourself in when you start going and looking into everything, which I've been lost on a couple of things as well, too. But when we talk about CDPR, and you start showing that this is like the main perspective that you're trying to show is that when you don't think that something like this could happen, you should always be able to think or question, question anything. I mean, anything you're given, that's the whole aspect of critical thinking is that you're looking at every single possible angle, even the craziest part of it as well, too. And the fact that there's all there's people out there that, I mean, believe the lone nut theory or believe you know, all the Warren, what the Warren Commission says, it's not maybe on an aspect of why aren't they questioning their government, but maybe it's on an aspect of because I don't think a lot of people want to know that their government has this type of power. I mean, the same reason no one even could think about it back then. I mean, people believed conspiracy, but they probably believed it wasn't their government necessarily, but it was some other some other force, maybe an oil company person or Russia or Cuba or something like that. You know, everyone has their little murmured thoughts. But when you find out that your government does have these types of capabilities, I've got this perspective from examining war events. Um, Howard Hunt is a good example where he talks about slathering LSD on a steering wheel is a good way to get somebody like you're like, doesn't matter if you did it or not, but when you're speculating about it, it just lets me know you're involved in the Central Intelligence Agency. People involved in doing Operation Midnight Climax, where they drugged random people, you know, possibly created the Unabomber. I mean, you get into some weird territory where it might sound conspiratorial, but with all the background evidence from prior events, you can literally make a timeline and plot every single thing. And then you necessarily can't predict what's going to happen next, but you can understand the direction of when an event does happen. You go, that could, that could easily be something. Yeah. You know, the, the craziest programs one could even envision existing, you don't have to make anything up. Just like you said, the church committee found that, that all the programs you've spoken about existed. Crazy stuff. Lathering, like you said, lathering LSD on a steering wheel. MK Ultra, Project Phoenix, you know, just... Um, does it, does it make you even think a little bit about how crazy it is that we can believe that another another government, China, Russia, pick one, that they could do that to their own people? And it's like, yeah, well, that's over there. But nobody questions it over here. Well, people question it over here, but not the general public. There's well, like that's this, the thing, isn't it? That, that ah, It's crazy. That, we, uh, that the majority of the American people believe that assassination could it wouldn't be they wouldn't be surprised if for instance um the former prime minister of japan was just assassinated that was a political assassination people in the united states wouldn't be surprised to learn that that was a cons that there was a conspiracy to assassinate the former prime minister of japan yet and in the united states we believe in conspiracies in all of our institutions, in religion, in sports, in business, yet the only place where it's questioned and at an institutional level is in power politics in the United States only. Isn't that interesting that, um, that the media accepts conspiracy you know, our controlled media accepts conspiracy almost in every single 
institution throughout the world, except in American power politics. And the people that say that this is crazy, even when documents are released, that it does prove that you, it is right, they'll just go, eh, and then they'll kind of like, they won't fully admit that they're wrong. They'll just accept it. Like, I wonder, like, how many people, you know, thought that it, like, oh, it's the Watergate, all that type of situation that was happening. It's just, it's conspiracy. And then it comes out, William Colby exposes it. And the, there's quotes from directors saying the CIA will never recover from this. Their reputation has been ruined. And people would be like, and then they'll move on to the next thing. It's like, you just spent so much time trying to build a wall, stopping from the information coming out. And then now you're just going to move on to something else. Like there's, I mean, I, I even brought this up to Jefferson Morley when I asked him about William Colby's death. And he said he took it more seriously than he did before. And it's just like, yeah, because when you really start diving into the JFK assassination, then you look at the RFK assassination. I mean, this they say it's a family curse. It's like, who's the curse? Like, is the curse another name for the government? I don't know. And you start getting into some aspects of like, no, there's a lot of situations. And I think it's not the idea that our government is bad. It's the idea that our government does stand for red, white and blue. But also the actors that are in the government necessarily might not be working for the best intentions. I don't necessarily think like the president has power. I think it has power to make physical changes in front of us, like gas prices or something like that, or maybe some environmental changes. Sure. But I also think that we have a really weird relationship with deep connections with business, um, a lot of aspects that shouldn't be involved in our government. And I, I think Richard explained this to me. Um, Trump was, bef well, before Trump, Kennedy was the richest president we've ever had. And anybody that can fund their own decisions, fund their own choices, and doesn't need to suckle at the tit of any other lobbyist or whoever to make a decision and has to owe them a favor, that's a threat. That's someone, that's a, that's a dangerous route, and especially if you have them as president. You have a person that doesn't want to go to war, doesn't want to expand out your territory. I mean, it's very simple to make your mind think of this in personal aspects where it goes, no, our government couldn't do that. There's no way. That's so unethical. That's so wrong. It's like you got to look at it from a military strategic standpoint. Was an aspect of not helping out Africa because we just didn't care about the people? No, we just wanted the land. That's the thing is that you got to look at it from that. Once you can talk that and you can say that and people can kind of go, okay, that, that makes a little bit more sense. You're, you're looking at like people look at it like the government's this evil corrupting force that needs to be stopped. It's like a, it's crazy. It's like, no, that's, you're looking at it wrong. It's just very, very good strategy. Like everything that happens is great strategy. And institutions don't exist without self-defense mechanisms in place. Kennedy was a threat to the establishment and to the existing structures of our institutions. And so it makes sense that the safety measures in place to protect those institutions solved that problem. Um, you, you mentioned uh, Kennedy's um, being so wealthy in, um, as a president, and he'd been, you know, I don't know if he was more wealthy than Franklin Roosevelt at the time, but money wasn't an issue to, to the Kennedys, of course. But he ended up being a traitor to his class. And I think that was another nail in his coffin, that, you know, he was Joe Kennedy's son. And all the business interests thought, oh, Joe Kennedy, former, you know, um, former rum runner um, working with, with uh, Onassis and all the other rum runners during, during, the, uh, during Prohibition. That's where he made his money. He was part of big business. And I, they thought that Kennedy, John F. Kennedy, would, would have been a friend to big business. But everything changed late in his pres or mid presidency after the cuban missile crisis everything changed and he made and after the death of his child 
everything changed. Uh, Kennedy changed his presidency towards a strategy of peace. And he became a traitor to his class. And you alluded to this, but I think that was one of the final nails in his coffin. When it comes to doing another film, I know you, you got the searchers out, but I'm just, I'm curious, have you thought about not maybe going down the JFK route, but have you even entertained the idea of another political assassination? I know Joe Green works on like the MLK, the RFK, um, and JFK as well, too. I'm just curious if you had any speculations about, even if it's not even political assassinations, a uh, second film. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And since The Searchers, I've made um, a number of other films, some shorts, I'm working on a feature right now, and they have nothing to do with, with um, political assassinations or anything political at all. Um, Did you burn yourself out with that? Well, I had to take a breather, <laughs> but I'm coming back, baby. Um, I just started working on a sequel to The Searchers, The Searchers Part Two. And um, there were so many researchers that I didn't get to interview uh, the first go around that, you know, my, my list right here is, is very long. It goes on and on and on. So, um, you know, I'm just really excited to, to interview more researchers, find out why they do what they do, and to get to talk to them about the fruits of their labor and get it on film. Um, and, you know, with, the, with my original film, I made, all of, I made a box set of all of those interviews. Um, raw interviews. It's 60 hours of it, raw interviews with researchers that I that are available from on my website um, to to watch for the the layperson to learn more about the researchers and for the seasoned researcher to learn even more about their colleagues. And that's a project that I that I'm refocusing my efforts on um, moving forward. I'm really excited about it. Um, I think, I think, I think you're gonna do good work. That's, that's like, I can't recommend uh, the searchers enough. Um, I just like, I just, I just saw it recently. So I'm going to make sure I drop it in a couple episodes as well too, because it's definitely put together very, very well. Um, like I said, it's going to take me a couple more watches um, just to be able to soak in the information. Um, I also watched the assassination of Miss Payne on Moonshine, so I need to go back for that um, to watch that again because I, I remember some of it. I don't remember all of it. It's um, an excellent film, and and uh, you know Max Good did such a good job with that film. Um, he's a terrific filmmaker and a better and a better guy. Um, where can people find your links um, to your website, uh, also your Twitter as well too, and any other links you have to promote? Yeah, everything is on my film's website, thesearchersfilm.com. And uh, my Twitter, my Facebook, upcoming projects. Um, I have a bio of John Judge there. I have a whole page about the documents and where we stand with those right now. So. The searchersfilm.com is, is the central, central point for Randy Benson and the assassination research. Well, I make sure I'll link it all in the description. It's been a pleasure chatting, and thanks for listening to this episode of Out of the Blank Podcast.